Good morning. On behalf of the California ISO, I'd like to welcome you to the Subscriber Participating Transmission Owner Meeting. My name is Elisandra Casillas, representing the Stakeholder Affairs Group here at the ISO, and I will be facilitating today's meeting. And I'm also joined by Deb Levine, Director of Infrastructure Contracts and Management. This presentation and other materials related can be found on the Miscellaneous Stakeholder Meetings webpage. Next slide, please. Some housekeeping reminders. This call is being recorded and the video file will be posted on the Miscellaneous Stakeholder Meetings webpage for information and convenience purposes only. The recordings and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. The meeting is structured to stimulate dialogue and engage different perspectives. Please keep comments professional and respectful. And in the interest of time, please try and be brief and refrain from repeating what has already been said so we so we can manage the time efficiently. Next slide, please. For questions, we will pause for questions periodically throughout the meeting. You can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx, or if you join via audio only, please press pound two on your device. Please remember to state your name and affiliation before making your comment. And if you need technical assistance during today's meeting, please feel free to send a chat to the event producer or myself. You may also send your question via chat to all panelists. Next slide, please. And from here, I will now turn the meeting over to Deb Levine. Thank you so much, Ellie. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, some of our panelists that are here from Transhust Express. We've got Roxanne Peruso, who's the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President for Transwest. David Smith, who's the Director of Engineering and Operations for Transwest. David Fuller, who is the Director of Business Development. And Patrick Ferguson, who's their FERC Counsel. All of these people have been integral in putting together the um, uh, uh, subscriber PTO model, and I thank them very much for their participation. So let's start out with where we're at for California. So California has set out that out-of-state wind resources are going to play a growing role in the state agency resource plan. You've got the California Public Utilities Commission has come out with their current preferred system plan that calls for an additional 1,500 megawatts of out-of-state wind um, by 2023. In addition to that, they've come out with the High Transportation Electrification Portfolio that calls for an, an additional 4,828 megawatts. I didn't make it up. That's just what's in the High Transportation Electrification Portfolio by 2035. So that's all from the PUC. In addition, the CEC and the CPUC are look, working on the 20-year outlook, which is part of SB100, which calls for an additional 10,000 gigawatts by 2040. So by the time the 1,500 and the 4,800 are in addition, with the 10,000 gigawatts being total by 2040. So with these projections, we're going to need to have a lot of opportunities for out-of-state winds, and specifically going ahead and trying to match both out-of-state and then in-state winds to the extent that it's possible. So in looking at this for the future, the ISO was trying to come up with opportunities, not necessarily decisions for load-serving entities, but opportunities that allowed load-serving entities to make decisions as to how they want to bring in the out-of-state wind that's called for in all of the state proposals. Next slide, please. So with that, TransWest, as part of the ISO tariff, approached the ISO about becoming a participating TO within the ISO balancing authority area. In order to do this, they needed to file by July 1st a notice of intent to become a participating TO and then file a application to become a participating TO. They've done both of these things. Um, Transwest, prior to this point in time, got approval from FERC for, <laughs> got approval from FERC 
for an open season to sell capacity on their transmission at a negotiated rate, which has been fully subscribed by the public company of Wyoming. The subscriber will be looking for off takers throughout the West. You'll see when I get to the slide on where the transmission line is, um, there's uh, opportunities to offtake power in Wyoming, in Nevada, and then down in California. So the transmission line itself includes an HVDC line and a 500 kV AC line to collect the wind resources from Wyoming and deliver them to California. As I said, TransWest Express has provided an application to become a participating TO which the ISO posted on its website consistent with the transmission control agreement on July 21st. Next slide, please. So with that, in trying to implement a new type of participating TO, there were a number of things to consider. Since the ISO is not going to be paying for this transmission line as part of its task, the intent was is to go ahead and come up with a model that allowed a remote transmission facility to become part of the ISO, ISO grid, but to have subscribers that would pay for the transmission, and in essence, the off takers will pay for their energy, transmission, congestion, and losses all the way to the point where it interconnects the existing ISO grid. The transmission predominantly is to be used for to meet state and utility energy policies, and most of the transmission needs to be subscribed in at least one direction, so that the entity who builds this transmission is not relying on the ISO to incorporate their transmission revenue requirements in its transmission access charge. As most of you know, the current transmission access charge is about $16 per megawatt hour for, for load and export. We don't want to go ahead and increase that, but we do want to provide opportunities for load serving entities to meet the state uh, requirements in both SB100 and in the CPUC preferred solutions in order to ensure that there are opportunities for the wind to get to California. The thought at this point in time is to go ahead and amend the transmission control agreement to include a new protocol. The protocol would go ahead and allow subscribers to join the ISO, provided that they have sufficient subscriptions on that transmission line to meet the revenue requirements required for that line. We would treat those subscriptions as, in essence, encumbrances, similar to a regular participating uh, TO that joins the ISO, Valley Electric, as being the most recent one. They had transmission contracts on their uh, transmission lines already. And so we treated those as encumbrances. We'll treat the subscriber encumbrances as if they were similar to existing contracts. That way, the rights that they are um, executing in the power purchase agreement will survive their becoming part of the KISO balancing authority area. We will be setting up the subscriber PTO as their own CAC area. Therefore, any costs that are incurred in that CAC area, um, exceptional dispatch as an example, would be the costs associated with the exceptional dispatch required by that CAC area and not spread to other TAC areas. The subscriber PTO would fund the entire transmission revenue requirements through their subscriber contracts and not through the transmission access charge. Uh, we would, to the extent that, that there's excess transmission, so as an example, TransWest is considering mostly subscribing the wind to serve load in uh, south of Wyoming either in Utah connecting into LADWP um, into uh, TWE Crystal, which is a new substation that could connect into Nevada Energy, or into California on the Harry Allen El Dorado line. Um, if there was, if they're subscribed north to south, 
there's a potential that transactions could be made in the ISO marketplace to go south to north. And in that case, they would have an incremental charge that we would charge the non-subscribers for use of that transmission. Similar to using the transmission within California, there is a charge associated with import um, where the load is served or export where uh, energy is going out of the balancing authority area. So we would add an incremental charge for wheeling. And as I said earlier, we're looking to go ahead and uh, support this concept by an amendment to the transmission control agreement. Next slide, please. So let me give you an overview of the project of how we're going to be expanding the ISO balancing authority area to the extent that um, TransWest Express gets uh, off takers um, to purchase the transmission um, and they actually end up building the lawn. Stop, 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 stop. Sorry. We have Kibitzing coming from the peanut gallery. Um, from those of you that have um, seen me a number of times uh, taking WebExes from home, I do have dogs. Um, sometimes they like to just get into the conversation, so I apologize in advance, um, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll be quiet for a while. So the TransWest Express line, um, in essence, is in the orange, <laughs> Orange Balancing Authority area. Yes, dogs do have strong opinions sometimes, um, especially if they're a 130 pound Bernese Mountain Dog, who is the one currently kibitzing at the moment. Um, TransWest Express, in essence, is going to build, be building all the substations you see in green. And the peach color is the new Balancing Authority area that will go all the way out to Wyoming. So starting at the top at, um, Substation number five is will be the new Ferris substation that will actually be in Pacific Corp East Balancing Authority area. And that will be the boundary between the CAISO and Pacific Corp East will be between, will be between uh, substation five, Ferris, and substation four, which is Wyoming. All of the wind generation is expected to connect to the Wyoming substation. And that will bring um, about 3,000 megawatts down the DC line, which is why I colored it orange versus the uh, uh, dotted green, um, which is the 500 kV AC line. And so the 3,000 megawatts will run from the Wyoming substation to the Utah substation. There's the opportunity at the Utah substation to interconnect at IPP, which for those of you familiar with the Intermountain Power Project, there's a uh, DC line that goes from IPP called the South Southern Transmission System, goes all the way from IPP down into the LA Basin. And off uh, the various municipal utilities, including Los Angeles, have rights on the Southern Transmission System. And actually the CAISO has rights on the Southern Transmission System today due to new transmission entitlements that have been turned over by the six cities as part of them becoming participating POs in the early 2000s. So we will have rights also um, on the, uh, I mean, that direction, if you want to come that direction into the CAISO Balancing Authority area. Then the line moves using 500 kV AC, the additional 1500 megawatts will move first to substation two, which we're calling TWE Crystal, and then on to the new substation, which will interconnect and loop in the Harry Allen Eldorado line, probably midline. And there's also a potential that they might build a direct connect from the new substation to Harry Allen. Harry Allen is currently in the uh, NVE, Nevada Energy's Balancing Authority area, and that's where the CAISO's current boundary is. We do have rights within the Harry Allen uh, substation that allows us to connect generation um, at that substation, and those generators would be part of the CAISO balance in the Gordy area. So as you can see, this line is going to be traveling great distances, but still be part of the CAISO balancing authority area. It will be eligible 
for meeting the bucket one RA requirements um, to the extent that a off-taker um, is using the wind generation for their RA and is in the CAISO balancing authority area. But it also gives the neighboring balancing authority areas, which are, uh, you know, LAD, WP, bank, et cetera, IID, still have a requirement to meet SB 100, while they don't have a requirement to meet the CPUC uh, goals, uh, they do have a requirement to, to meet the state um, uh, Senate goals. So with that, what I'd like to do is just pause here. I've kind of given you a whole overview of what the project is and see if there are any specific questions before I go on to additional slides. The following slides, just so everybody knows, is gonna talk about a, a bit on the rate structure um, that we're contemplating at this point and also uh, then go on to the next steps for the project. So I see Steve Greenleaf has his hand raised. Operator, if you could go ahead and open his line, please. Please go Hi, ahead, Deb. your line is unmuted. Hi, Deb, uh, Steve Greenleaf, Brookfield. Uh, thanks for having this uh, call today. Um, real quick question on the uh, encumbrances. I'm assuming the proposed encumbrance is similar to the way existing encumbrances are treated. And the reason I ask is just to kind of draw a distinction between um, it's not that the um, uh, contracted transmission capacity comes off the top of the ATC. It, it, as far as the CAISO optimization goes, it effectively um, receives a high penalty price. Is that right? Just to get priority on the transmission? Correct. Plus, they've also, it'll be a little bit bigger than a regular encumbrance because a regular encumbrance just handles the, um, from a settlement's perspective, just handles the transmission piece. Um, as far as settlements is concerned, as part of the thinking at the moment is the power purchase agreement will include the energy, the transmission, the congestion, and the losses. So we wouldn't obviously make them double pay for something that they've already paid for as part of their power purchase agreement. But as far as dispatch is concerned, you're correct. They'll get the high penalty price coming in at the um, uh, looped in new substation. Okay, and then will that penalty be price be comparable to what you utilize today for the existing encumbrances or ETCs or will it be something yes. different? No, the thought at the moment is, is it will be equivalent to the existing encumbrances. Okay, all right. And so, and I, I think you'll get into this in a moment, but the CRNs effectively assume the entity would schedule with the CRN and that would effectively uh, kind of uh, cancel out any of the CAISO charges that would otherwise apply. Like you said, the congestion, the, okay. The losses the energy, correct. Okay, okay, thank you very much. No problem. Um, operator, could you open Shishan's line, please? Sure, please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Sushant from Clearway Energy. Uh, thanks, Debbie. Uh, the question is about how uh, delivery from El Dorado or Harry Allen into ISO and what the impact would be or how the mechanics of that uh, analysis work out? Uh, or is there any implication of that? And I, I don't know if any of the following slides address that. Um, there is implication and I do have a specific slide that addresses that. So if we could hold that question. Okay, I'll hold it on that. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. Steve, did you have another question or? Forgot to lower your hand. Gotcha. Okay, any other questions at this point? As a reminder, right. if you're connected right. to the um, computer audio or use the call me feature in WebEx, you may enter the question queue by using the WebEx raise hand icon located just above the chat panel. You'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. If you're just on the phone line and not using the WebEx audio, please dial pound two 
on your phone to enter the question queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. You can also submit your questions in the chat. Uh, to submit written questions, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. All right, thank you so much. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions at this point, so why don't we go ahead and move on. So this slide is trying to depict what the current thought process is as far as the potential rate structure um, for uh, the Transwest Express example. And so in essence, what the subscriber, um, whoever, in essence, gets into a power purchase agreement with Public Company of Wyoming, who is a subscriber for the entire transmission line. They would have no charges for the CAISO um, on the Teal Pass. So from Wyoming to Utah to Crystal to New or to Harry Allen, they've already paid for, as part of the power purchase agreement, the cost of the transmission, the cost of the energy from the wind generation, the cost of congestion on that line and the losses to get the um, wind output to wherever it leaves the Transwest Express line. So as an example, if the subscriber were to get off the line in Utah, they in essence would pay for um, the exit point going to IPP and all of those costs would already be paid. Um, if they were going to go into um, Nevada Energy Balancing Authority area, they could get off at Crystal or Harry Allen and all of those costs would be paid. If they were going to go to the new substation, then and into the KISO BA, but what happened is, is they paid the costs associated with transmission, energy congestion and losses all the way to the new substation or also into Harry Allen. But if they're coming into the KISO balancing authority area, all of the KISO tax charges and all other applicable charges would then apply to the load that's being served by that generation coming into California. So just so all of the existing participating TOs know, um, they in essence are still going to get the full wheeling revenue or the load that's being served by the um, wind generation coming in, uh, they're still gonna be paying that tax charge for that load. Um, so there should be no loss of revenue as far as wheeling access charge is concerned um, because the transmission that is being used from Harry Allen to El Dorado Inn is existing transmission that still should be compensated um, for the generation that's coming in from Wyoming. If it's an example, there's excess wind out there at some point in time and someone from California or Utah or Nevada wants to purchase that generation, then what would happen is, is that the KISO will have an LMP price at Wyoming um, and use that LMP price along with all KISO charges, um, except as far as the uh, act transmission charge is concerned, we would use the SPTO wheeling charge not the KISO's transmission access charge because the revenue requirements associated with the transmission leg from Wyoming to Utah or to Crystal or to New is not part of the existing transmission access charge. So that would be an adder um, and the sole transmission charge that would accrue to anyone who has an orange, you know, new firm use of transmission coming out of Wyoming. To the extent that there's excess generation in California um, or excess generation um, coming up from the south to the north, in essence, whatever um, energy is associated with that would pay both the tax to get to El Dorado or Harry Allen and then pay the SPTO wheeling charge to wherever it comes out. We would have LMPs associated with obviously the generation um, that originally uh, generated the excess energy within the KISO balancing authority area. And then energy, any, any energy ancillary services, 
other applicable charges, GMC, et cetera, all of that would be charged to um, the entities wheeling up through that direction. So I know that's kind of a lot, and um, I've tried to make it as simplistic as possible. But before I go on to some examples, does anybody have any questions at this point? The next two slides will give you actual examples of, of you know, 100 megawatts going one direction as a subscriber versus, you know, going the opposite direction and what are the charges that would accrue. So let me just pause here and see if anybody has any questions on this slide. Being the engineer, I like the pictures. I can't help it. Okay, operator, let's go on to the next slide. So as an example, if you're a subscriber, you've already paid for your transmission, your energy, your losses and congestion to get all the way to the new substation or to the Harry Allen substation. You're in essence subscribed, you've purchased 100 megawatts of Wyoming wind and you're a load serving entity in SC15. So you've paid for all of that to the public company of Wyoming who purchased all of the uh, uh, wind generation and the transmission from TransWest Express. And then once you get to the new substation or Harry Allen, there's gonna be an LMP price at that point. So you'd in essence pay whatever the LMP price is at the whichever point you enter at, along with the ISO tax charge, the GMC, and other appropriate charges in order to serve your load. If you're a non-subscriber you and there's excess wind up in Wyoming, you'd pay the LMP price at Wyoming, you'd pay the transmission charge associated with going from Wyoming to let's say the new substation, and then you would pay the ISO transmission access charge from the new substation in all the way to your load along with the GMC and other appropriate charges. Um, Steve, let me go ahead and just go the other direction and then I'll, I'll um, ask for your question. So next slide, please. So if you're going south to north, if you're in essence a subscriber and you've already gone at, and you're purchasing generation out of the market, you in essence would pay the LMP price at the new substation along with the tax, the GMC, and other appropriate charges. And then you would go ahead and um, you've already paid for the energy transmission losses and congestion to get it back up to wherever your um, load output might be. Maybe it's at Crystal, maybe it's at IPP, um, maybe you're at PAC up in Pacific Corp East. You've already paid for that piece of it, so we would not double charge you for that. If you're a non-subscriber and you wanna go ahead and export um, at let's say IPP, um, you're a Utah utility, there's excess generation in the KAIFO market, um, so you would in essence pay, the non-subscriber would pay the LMP at new, um, substation along with the tax, the GMC, and other appropriate charges. And then since you're, you've already paid for the energy, you've already paid for the losses and congestion, um, then you would go ahead and pay for the wheeling access charge as an adder on top of um, the tax charge that you paid to get it to the new substation. Um, these are all conceptual at this point in time. We still need to get down um, to, you know, roll up our sleeves with the settlement people and the market operations people. But because uh, Transwest Express has provided their application, we wanted to put this concept out to everybody um, in advance of that. So it looks like I have a whole bunch of questions at this point. So let's start with Steve Greenleaf. Um, operator, could you open Steve's line, please? Sure. Please go ahead, the line is unmuted. Uh, thanks, Deb. Steve Greenlee Brookfield. A couple quick questions. Uh, first, on the kind of the balance between uh, subscriber rights and new firm use, I just want to uh, 
walk through kind of a hypothetical, just so I understand it. So assuming the subscriber has is serving load in the CAISO BAA um, and the wind resources uh, are registered EIR or whatever with the CAISO, um, and the CAISO does the forecast for that resource. So just thinking through on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, the CAISO develops those forecasts. Those forecasts effectively become the schedules for the resource. Uh, so it'll match the wind profile. So on a day-to-day -day basis, is just from a scheduling and transmission utilization perspective, that um, the forecast becomes the schedule. The balance uh, uh, above that, between that schedule, assuming matching the wind profile and uh, the remaining ATC becomes new firm use. It's not that, right, that the subscriber contract megawatts, you know what I mean? You know, say they have a thousand megawatt rights on the, or 500 megawatt rights on the facility. It's not that that quote unquote gets reserved transmission every day. It's really, it matches the schedule, which most likely in this case would be the wind profile. I hope that makes sense, but. It does, it does make sense, but the subscriber who's already paid for the line could actually make a purchase out of Pacific Corp um, and bring generation down on their, whatever their Delta is. So let's say they sure. have. okay. Yeah, let's say yeah. they've got, you know, your. 500 megawatts is what they subscribe to, but that day the wind is only going to add up to 450. So they could purchase 50 megawatts out of Pacific Corp East and bring that down, and they've already paid for the transmission um, losses and congestion to get all the way from Wyoming in. They just have to pay for the energy and losses associated with going from Ferris to Wyoming. Right, and those would be two separate schedules, but associated with the same CRN, so the same settlement treatment would apply and the priority on those two separate schedules, so to speak. Okay, good. Great, thanks. Um, and then second question, just back on page nine, I just want to, uh, slide nine, just wanted to confirm on, I think it's slide nine. Operate slide, please. Yeah, on the first Thank bullet you. point with the, the second sub bullet, um, I just want to confirm effectively um, subscriber whatever has the unique set settlement treatment to the new or Harry Allen, but will pay the basis difference between new slash Harry, Harry Allen and SB15 and the hub. That's what the current discussion is, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, understood, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, operator, can you open Sandeep's line? Please go ahead, Sandeep, your line is unmuted. Hello, Deb, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, this is Sandeep Arora with Rev Renewables. Just a uh, quick question, and maybe if we can go to slide eight. That might uh, help with the question I'm trying to ask. Okay, so I'm trying to understand, I mean, in this concept, is CalISO's physical boundary moving uh, all the way to Wyoming, maybe all the way up to this Ferris substation, or is it like, you know, virtually moving, if you want to call it that, or conceptually moving by virtue of these incremental possible transmission capacity that, you know, might now become available to Kaiso. So just the distinction I'm trying to make is where the boundary is today, right outside Harry Allen, is that physically moving all the way or is it just moving by virtue of implementation of this concept? And then a follow-up question really is how would the, the, I'm just trying to understand or think about, you know, how would the MIC allocation rules, um, the maximum import capability allocation rules across interties apply in, in this new concept? Um, okay. Hopefully that so, question makes sense. Yes, it does. So let me try the first question. So the Kaiso boundary in essence is going to be between Ferris and Wyoming. 
While Ferris is a new substation that is being built up and packed by TransWest Express, um, Ferris will be in Pacific Corp East Balancing Authority area and Wyoming will be in the Kaiso Balancing Authority. So the physical break will, between, will be between those two substations, probably Midway, which is very similar um, to the boundaries that we have with a lot of um, neighboring balancing authority areas. And with respect to the MIC, I have a slide a little bit later on, so I'd like to go ahead and wait until I get to that slide to address that question. Okay, thanks, Deb. All right, operator, can you open up the line for Chris Devon? Sure, Chris, please go ahead. The line is unmuted. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Hi, Chris. Hi, uh, yeah, it's Chris Devon from Customized Energy Solutions. So um, just had a couple other questions kind of building a little bit on what um, Steve had asked and just was curious on the market um, impacts here with, with this being in. Chris, actually, uh, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Your audio is breaking out. <clears throat> Can you okay, please repeat second. your question? Can you hear me a little bit better now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just curious as to as to kind of how this interacts. If there's, as as you indicated, there was going to be some additional potential to to wheel like non subscriber energy across this this, and it would be you know based on. I'm assuming it would be all based on the the market based processes like the Kaiso has already, since you're saying it's going to be LMP and, and calculated all according to the tariff like it is. Today. So, I guess my question is, it really is, I'm trying to just understand how this is going to work with the you know, calculation of the congestion and things like that. If somebody has um, that schedule, like in the day ahead of you know 400 megawatts of wind, and then but let's say they have encumbrance of you know, 500 or something like that, and, and they could, you know, the transfer up to 500 if they scheduled only 400, that would potentially cause some level of congestion versus if they scheduled their 500, that could cause a different level of congestion. So I'm just trying to understand how this impacts the market. And, you know, if you're going to back out those charges because they've, you know, paid for those, those different, uh, you know, components through their PPA, um, although it's not, you know, based on market-based pricing, is there going to be some impact to those other transactions, and, and are they going to be, like, uplifted, or is there going to be some of the kind of make-hold payments or things associated with that? I guess I'm just trying to understand the process a little bit more. I don't know if that's very clear the way I asked it, Deb, but perhaps maybe that's something we could just, you know, talk about offline, but, but let me just stop there. Okay. Um, so the intent is, is that the subscriber has already paid for the transmission, energy, congestion, and losses um, all the way from Wyoming to whatever their takeout point is. And they shouldn't have to pay twice um, if they're using the transmission line that they built. Um, so the congestion, there in essence wouldn't be congestion costs costs on the subscriber portion. Um, there could be congestion costs on the new firm use portion. Um, so yeah, so let me let me let me just jump back in. I guess what I'm trying to ask is that I I, I hear what you're saying that you know the, the encumbrance shouldn't have to pay if they've already um, you know subscribed at a set PPA price, right? So so I get that part of it, but what I'm trying to get at is it seems like this is going to impact the market outcomes depending on how those encumbrances are actually used. So if the encumbrance decides to use all of its, its you know, um, schedule or, or maybe part of it, depending on what's happening in the market and prices and such may impact how the Tyco calculates those other charges. And so what I'm trying to just understand is, I guess, is, is the Kaiso going to just simply, you know, apply those impacts to the other New use uh, charges and, and the other LMPs for any of those other market-based transactions that occur. Or is there going to be some kind of true up or you know other type of consideration? I, I guess it also goes to some of the stuff that Sandeep was getting at with the the BA boundary and you know is there going to be like CRRs that go along this pathway as well and things like that. I guess uh, maybe I just need more details and and you know maybe that can come out later as we develop this. But I guess I'm just 
you know, kind of curious as to how this all interacts with the market based processes, because it seems like it's a bit of a out of market process with all these encumbrances. And then, and then, you know, I, I hear what you're saying that they're paying for the actual, uh, you know, congestion and such, but the congestion is actually calculated in the, in the market versus the, you know, overall PPA price is going to vary and be different. It could be, you know, pretty different depending on the outcomes of the market, I think. So anyways, I know that's a lot. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just kind of getting into too many details at this point and can wait for you guys to maybe publish something on more, more details on this, but, but just some curious things that I'm, I'm wondering about and how this will work. Um, well, we're still trying to work everything out at this point, um, but we wanted to, since we just posted their PTO application, we wanted to post um, for Mark participants' knowledge as to how we would incorporate TransWest Express in as a participating TO. So that's kind of item number one. So we're trying to get in front of um, the comments that are going to be due um, in 60 days uh, once the uh, 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 the comments on the PTO application itself. So first let me okay. put that as a foundation. So there's still a number of these things that we need to work out. As far as congestion is concerned, um, since they've already gone ahead and paid for the use of the transmission, they built their own transmission line from their generation to the new substation, they're, they're in essence, is congestion on that line for them. Now, to the extent that there are other transactions on that line new, using the new firm use, it's only intended at this point that the new firm use would pay for that congestion component. Got it. Okay. And I'll just, I'll just uh, mention that I, I understand the concept, but I'm just going to say that I'm sure that the market is going to be impacted by the use of those encumbrances. So that's, that's what I'm trying to get at is, how is those? How are those uses going to actually end up being reflected in the market, and are they going to be uplifted? Or I think there needs to be some some more discussion about how that might be. You know, the settlements piece of this. So that can wait, obviously. So thanks for that explanation, um, just to start with. And, and you know, I think one of the other things that came to mind on this for me was the interactions with the Kaiso's new uh, uh, transmission services market scheduling priorities initiative proposal. So. It seems like this is kind of doing something similar to that, but, but this is on a different track outside of that because this is a new PTO subscriber model. So uh, I'm just curious if the CAISO, you know, plans to talk through how that interacts or, or you know, has any, any coordination between these, these concepts or thinks that there's any touch points. Do you have any reaction to that at all, Deb? Um, we haven't gotten down that road yet. Okay. Just something to think about, I'd suggest maybe a little bit more. And then I'll hold my question on the mix up for later and let Sandeep maybe go back and get back to that. But on the RA bucket, one thing you were mentioning earlier, one last oh. question I had on that, but did you mean that that would be, you know, counting towards the, the bucket went one for RSE and, and EDAM concept? Is that what you're getting at with that statement earlier? Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, that's all I have for now, thank you. Okay. All right, operator, could you open up Mike Florio's line? Mike, please go ahead. The line is unmuted. Yes, hi, Deb. How you doing? Good, Mike. Hi. How about you? Good. Uh, I just wonder, is this going to require tariff changes beyond uh, just the new PTO agreement? At this point in time, we believe we can do it all in the transmission control agreement and do not need to make tariff changes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right, operator, could you jump to slide nine? Uh, 10. Next slide, please. I forgot Ellie had the slides in the front. Um, so, as I just mentioned to Mike, at this point in time, we believe we can do this all through an amendment to the transmission control agreement. We would be adding what we're calling uh, the subscriber PTO protocol as a new appendix 
to the transmission control agreement. It would incorporate, uh, shoot. Uh, operator, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Deb. Okay, good, thank you. Um, it would incorporate the subscriber encumbrance that we've talked about and the subscriber rights would be treated just like existing contract rights. And the subscriber wheeling charge, as I said, is an additive charge above the regional wheeling access charge that is collected as part of the transmission access charge that the ISO has. Um, if you are a scheduling coordinator that uses um, the Transwest Express line, you in essence would pay the uh, additional wheeling charge associated with use of that transmission and any revenues collected for the use of that transmission would be given solely to uh, Transwest Express as the subscriber PTO. Um, next slide, please. So here's Sandeep's question. Um, the Wyoming generation intends to get into cluster 15, which will open in April of 2023. Um, in that uh, uh, study, as uh, Sandeep and Shishant know, uh, we'll go through the determination as to the generation coming in, um, what is the impact on reliability network upgrades and then deliverability network upgrades. Um, and to the extent that the uh, existing internal KISA system needs additional network upgrades in order to allow the generation coming in from the Wyoming wind uh, to get to the default laps, then um, that additional uh, uh, network upgrades uh, would be required to be paid by the uh, uh, generators, uh, the Wyoming wind generators. Um, to the extent that the uh, upgrades take a while compared to the power purchase agreement that is made. And if the off taker actually has market import capability um, at Harry Allen or at um, El Dorado, um, they could use that market import capability in advance of the network upgrades being uh, completed. There are also a planning studies going on that are going to look at increasing, as part of the TPP process, the import capability at um, El Dorado and Perry Allen anyway, in order to support the new transmission, um, the new uh, wind generation that's required to come from out of state. Um, those studies are a little bit further down the road. I believe they are in um, 20, 2024 and 2026, um, but it is anticipated that market import capability is going to be increasing um, at the uh, El Dorado, Harry Allen, um, along with Palo Verde in order to be able to bring um, more off, off peak, <laughs> more off uh, wind generation, uh, into the Kaiso Balancing Authority area. Um, next slide, please. So the benefits to California um, and the ISO as far as allowing the subscriber PTO proposal to move forward is it enables the remote renewable resources into the Kaiso without increasing the ISO's transmission access charge. Um, it's incremental capacity that can come in and it meets the state objectives that have already been defined by both the CPUC, the CEC, and uh, the Senate. So we've, we've got a number of legislative uh, needs for it along with um, uh, state agency needs for the out-of-state out uh, wind generation. Um, this is not intended to require any load serving entity to sign up for this wind generation. We're just trying to give um, load serving entities options as far as development is concerned. We are also having discussions with uh, generation in New Mexico, wind generation, and how that can come into the Kaiso Balancing Authority area. Um, but with TransWest Express providing an application to become a participating TO, 
ISO needs to follow its tariff and the transmission control agreement timelines in order to uh, implement or make decisions as far as that transmission is concerned. And we look to provide, you know, open access transmission to anybody who wants it and to honor the subscriber agreements that will be created um, by the Transwest Express line to the extent that it's in the KISO Balancing Authority area and give consumers in California a choice. Next slide, please. Uh, we're missing a slide. Uh, can you back up a slide? Back up a slide before that. Ah, there it is. Oh, I already talked about that. Okay, so that's where the mic is. All right. Uh, go ahead. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so as far as next steps are concerned, we are taking comments on this presentation. Those would be due on August 15th. Um, and if you could go ahead and submit those to ISO Stakeholder Affairs at kaito.com. And then consistent with the transmission control agreement, um, the ISO is required to post any application to become a participating TO on the ISO website for 60 days. And comments are due on the application to become a participating TO. Those comments are due by September 19th. And those comments should be sent to regulatory contracts at kaito.com. And then based on all the comments received, both from the presentation and from the uh, application itself, the ISO will consider those in the amendment for the transmission control agreement um, and make a determination to include Transwest Express as a subscriber PTO and move forward with the amendment of the TCA. Um, so with that, let me open up the line before I turn it back to Ellie. Um, operator, can you open up Chris's line, please? Sure. Chris, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Okay. Hey, hey again, Deb. It's uh, Chris Devon with Customized Energy Solutions. So just trying to wrap my head around this a little bit more, and I apologize for all the detailed questions. Um, but I guess maybe, maybe just to start with, like procedurally, um, before I ask the Nick question, I just I'm just curious: Are, are you guys going to post like a paper about this and how it all work, um, or is this kind of just going to be like presented through these these kind of slide decks? Um, it'll be presented through these kind of slide decks. Okay, so how are stakeholders going to understand how this stuff's going to get settled and, and, and understood if there's no tariff change and you're just going to do it through the TCA? I'm just a little bit concerned with this process, I think. The settlement through the settlements is going to be consistent with the existing settlement structure that we already have. So that's why we don't need to make any tariff changes is what our current um, discussion has been internally. To the extent that we get further down the road and get more into the details of all of this and determine that a tariff change would be required, then we would have to do a stakeholder process to make those tariff changes. Okay, well, to my uh, kind of perception of this, I guess it just seems like what we're doing is creating a new type of transmission service that's very similar to what we're talking about in the transmission service market scheduling priorities initiative where it's like kind of a subscriber model or a, a fund rate payer funded i mean sorry a participant funded subscription where you're creating an encumbrance so it just seems to me like this is actually creating a new type of policy frankly um as opposed to just being something that should be done through this change to the tca um so i think it should be stakeholder a little bit more frankly um but but so that's just my opinion i'd just like that to be known um, and then, you know, I guess just on the, the mix of as far as that goes, um, if the border is going to get extended way out to Wyoming, is the KISO going to be developing you know, like interface prices to going out to different intertie points way out to Wyoming? And is there going to be new intertie points that, that the MIC has to be allocated on all the way out there? Or is it just going to be still only MIC at like Harry Allen at the border kind of where it is today? Um, that hasn't been determined yet. 
Okay. So I'll just stop because I think there needs to just be more discussion on this and, you know, review the comments that, of, that come in after this. But I'll, I, I just re I really recommend that I think there should be more um, kind of formalized stakeholder process around this because it seems to be like a, a lot of changes that could impact a lot of things pretty significantly. Uh, I'll just stop there. Thanks for the time today, Deb, and, and appreciate the presentation. All right, thank you. Operator, can you open up Steve Greenleaf's line? Sure, please go ahead, the line is unmuted. Uh, thanks, Deb. Steve Greenleaf, Brookfield. Two quick questions. Just on the, uh, if you can go back to the slide, it kind of relates to Sandeep's question on the Ferris Wyoming um, uh, interface. It's, that, that'll be the border between uh, Pac East and the Kaiso BA. Um, is that going to create a new, is that, I, I, I'm not a, exactly clear on the existing configuration, but does that impact the ETSRs between PAC and, and the CAISO in the context of WEIM and obviously potentially EDAM? Maybe it's premature to know, but. No, it would. It's a new path between CAISO and PAC East. Okay, so the ETSRs would be established, but somehow those, obviously the encumbrances would still be protected uh, on, the, on the flow end. Correct. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, I never seem to remember correctly, on the, <laughs> on the flow in between El Dorado and Harry Allen, uh, Harry Allen's the, the tie point, right? Can you talk about just briefly on the how, how the flows work between El Dorado and Harry Allen? You have that potential new intertie right in the middle now, but right, right. So Harry Allen is a um, 2,700 megawatt flow from in essence Nevada into El Dorado, um, and to the extent that you put another 1,500 megawatts coming in at the new substation, then that's gonna impact the ability to flow from new substation into El Dorado. Um, and El Dorado in essence is our point that brings generation down into the LA Basin. Perry Allen does not connect uh, to the LA Basin at this time. Okay, okay. So effectively those flows at the new will kind of compete with what's coming in from Harry Allen into El Dorado. And it's, until, right, until yeah. it's been, if there's sufficient room or not um, based on the generator interconnection studies and the TPP that will be done. Okay, yeah, okay. Understood, thank you. Thanks. Um, Robbie, wow, I haven't talked to you in quite a while. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please hi. go ahead. Yeah, hi, Robbie Sven Karen here with Southwestern Power View. So I guess a couple of questions. You can go to the generation interconnection and deliverability slide, a couple of slides up. Uh, I think, can you go back? There you go. There you go. Yeah, that's it. So if the generation is going to apply through cluster 15, then I, I assume that when the, if deliverability is granted, then those generators will be granted FCDS status. That's just one question to confirm that. Um, That's correct. Okay. Then um, the last part says that they could use the use MIC potentially in the interim period, but if it's, this, this would be internal generation. So, Normally, is it make reserve for import generation as opposed to internal? There's still a discussion internally as to how where we're going to put the um, uh, initial mix, so to speak, because the boundary for the mix at the moment is at El Dorado and Harry Allen, and so until Transwest Express builds any network upgrades that might be required inside our system then is the mix going to stay at Harry Allen in El Dorado or does it move out, um, which is one of the questions that Chris asked, 
is it going to move out to Wyoming ICT and Transwest Express Crystal uh, interconnection points? Those will be new BA boundaries, but how does the mix interact when you've got this new line coming in and it needs network upgrades internal to our existing balancing authority area? Um, so that's why that note was there that um, until those network upgrades were built, if the entity had um, MIC at El Dorado Harry Allen, then they could use that MIC in order to get their generation home until the network upgrades were built. Okay, so this is kind of like, uh, yeah, it sounds like you're treating this, it's like a hybrid situation because if a, a generator applies to connect to another um, KISO point, let's say they apply to connect to uh, a KISO intertide point, but as internal generation, then um, they wouldn't have the option, the, the, the load serving entities wouldn't have the option to use MIC while they're waiting for upgrades to be completed. They would, they would just be energy only until that point. Correct, or interim deliverability to the extent that interim deliverability is available. Okay, but here these generators would be given kind of a, a special provision of being able to, the customers could use MIC or subscribers could use MIC in the interim period, or that's just being proposed. If they had that capability, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. All right. Any other questions before I turn it over to Ellie? All right. And I well, did see a couple questions in the chat. Oh, okay. All right. And they are actually both from Speedy McLean from the CEC. And the first question is procedurally, does the amended TCA need to be final prior to approval of the PTO application? Oh, say that again? Or here, let me. Uh, procedurally, the amended TCA need to be final prior to approval of the PTO application? No. The TCA is negotiated and executed after the application has been accepted. Excellent, thank you, Deb. And his second question is, if another transmission developer were to file a PTO application tomorrow, would this model apply to their application as well? Well, they can't exactly file an application tomorrow. Applications are only allowed on January 1st and July 1st of every year, but to the extent that a similarly situated transmission developer were to file uh, an application to become a subscriber PTO, yes, it would also apply to them if they were similarly situated. Excellent, thank you, Deb. There are no further questions in the chat. I do not see any callers in the queue as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Shriaz. If we can please jump to slide 15. Before we close today's meeting, the California ISO is pleased to announce this year's Stakeholder Symposium, which will be held in person at the State Credit Union Convention Center in downtown Sacramento on November 9th and 10th. Registration for the event is now open and available under the Stay Informed tab on kaiso.com. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at symposiumred at kaiso.com. Thank you for joining today's discussion. As a reminder, this meeting was recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. The video file will be posted on the Miscellaneous Stakeholder Meetings webpage for a limited time after this meeting. We look forward to receiving your comments and have a great rest of your day. Operator, you may now conclude the call. Thank you, Ellie. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.